This is Progman Rob for PowerOfMetal.dk. Here's my conversation with the great Dan Swano. Let me start by saying, first of all, you're a busy guy. You've done, I don't know, what haven't you done? You've been doing the producing, the mixing, the engineering, and, and it seemed like there for a while that's what you're going to do. So I was surprised when you jumped back into recording that, one, you had time to do it, and I wasn't sure if you were interested in doing it. So you did Witherscape, and I was like, holy crap, that's amazing. What, what made you decide the time was right to do that? I would say that, that the, um, the one thing that really got me back in, into the whole uh, being in a band, writing, you know, I was so tired of the whole thing because, let's face it, I, I've, been, I've been in a band since I was seven years old. Wow. That, that I consider to be like the biggest thing in my life. It was, it was with my two older brothers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we had a repertoire of, I think, 20 songs. We recorded things, and, uh, you know, it's still there. I listen mm-hmm. to it sometimes for a laugh. You know, I play <laughs> the organ and sing in my, my homemade English, which is complete gibberish, you know, it means nothing. <laughs> but um, I, I tried, you know. Yeah. And from that moment, I, I formed bands with all the neighbor kids, and one of, one of the, the guys who lived a, a few blocks away ended up being my, my partner in crime for... I would say from 81 to the year 2000. We were always in a band together. Yep. Uh, but never in one of those metal bands. We were always playing hard rock and progressive rock and mm-hmm. soul together. And I think, I, I always felt after completing yet another album, and I think, well, when will it all end? You know, when will it dry up? Because you hear about uh, all these uh, favorite guys, of you you know, your favorite performers, and say, ah, I went through a rough patch, I couldn't write shit, you know. Uh, yeah spend a year trying to be inspired and say, ha, fuck, that will never happen to me. But Mm. secretly, I I wondered when, when will it come? Because eventually, it will, you know? And that that kind of happened around the time of, uh, I would say, I already felt a struggle around writing the stuff for the Nightingale Invisible album Mm -hmm. and my part for the Bloodbath, Nightmares, I just felt this is not my A game here. It's kind of, kind of a B plus game, you know? Yep. And I, I was pretty sure that I, I need to make a decision because I felt the industry was taking a turn to the worst with lower budgets and it was this whole download thing was also yep. really messed up. And, that, at the whole, and, and then also came the loudness war shit and I felt I really need to focus on getting my mixing and mastering skills and really go back to... Uh, to, to ground zero or whatever from this yep. mixing and matching because that's where my career will be. As a musician, I never took the steps to quit my day job and try to survive from, from getting that kind of money every month to pay the bills. It was never in the cards for me, you know? Yep. I saw how my friends suffered and they were doing weird project bands just to pay the bills, you know, as a, that's mm-hmm. not for me. So what I did was that I, I built a small mix room I moved away from my spacious cool flat into a like 15 square meter flat mm. uh, and a, a pretty small mix room and I quit my day job to focus on mixing and mastering and I even took the guitars and the keyboards away from the studio to not distract me because it was all about equalizers, compression, mixing, making sure that even loud sounded good and it paid off, you know. Yeah. I learned so much in, in those dog years and eventually... I stumbled across an acoustic uh, somewhere and I made a riff or whatever, but it was never really so that I I just said to myself, okay, face it, it's over. Mm -hmm. You're now an engineer. And be happy that you don't have to be uh, doing like selling hot dogs or whatever, you know? You are still in the industry. You're still connected. You're mixing the bands uh, that you love rather than touring with them, you know? Right, right. And uh, then just one day I bumped into this Ragnar guy. He started working at this music shop where I did some part-time work. And um, he just seemed like me 10 years before. Mm-hmm. He had a shitload of good ideas on the CD for no band whatsoever. He just <laughs> wrote awesome stuff and he didn't use it for anything because he was too busy, you know? Yep. And I was like, fuck, that's a gold mine. I want to I wanna use that. So that was the kind of the moment I felt to take some of the ideas that I had been writing. Uh, I mean, I, I still wrote a few riffs every now and then, you know, but not like full records in right. two weeks like I could when I was uh, younger. So eventually we just decided that we should put together a project and we should get together in the rehearsal room. I would start playing drums again mm-hmm. after like uh, not doing it for a long time, mm-hmm. selling my kit and all. And uh, just face to face, 
knocking out riffs, trying ideas, and getting the vibe from the riff before and just create new riffs on the spot, you know, the way it used to be. And I just said, fuck, this is cool. This is cool again, you know? Yep. And uh, at that point, I felt secure in my um, mixing and mastering had reached a level where I was getting some seriously cool bands to work with, and I felt that it sounded good. I, I didn't really need to improve anything that was already improved, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I allowed myself to go back to uh, starting um, using the studio also as a writing tool to put, uh, bought a new guitar, I bought a bass, I bought a kick-ass uh, workstation keyboard, so I couldn't make any excuses, oh, the sound is crappy, let's watch TV, you know? Yeah. So it was all about getting everything to make me actually feel guilty for not playing that wonderful, handmade, one-of-a-kind guitar. <laughs> and that worked, because yeah. I played the shit out of it to justify the price, you know? Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden I had written the Wind Escape record, and I had written the Nightingale stuff, and oh, here we have albums. Let's sign that deal with Central Media and let's get on with the, the second phase of my life as a performer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's amazing because it was like, and I, and I wasn't, I thought for sure that, that Nightingale, you know, after, after White Darkness was, was done, which was, which was fine, I mean, in, in some respect in that I felt there was so much good music that it was, it was fine to, for that to be over, but I thought, well, that, that's a shame. If it... If, if one band could come back, you know, I thought, <laughs> gee, Nightingale would be really cool. And then I see Retribution, and it's like, that's, I mean, how, I mean, w w how did, now you did the Witherscape, so that the motivation was finding uh, Ragnar to do that. How was it with Nightingale? Was it just, there was other stuff that was more progressive, and you, want, you, you felt that it was right for a Nightingale album? I would say that, that both me and my brother wrote some tracks and we also, um, I think we both felt that, that the well had run dry also of older material. I mean, my brother, he wrote a trillion songs uh, in the 80s and in the 90s for his solo project and we kind of used a lot of his already written tracks but just translated, um, not really translated, we wrote new lyrics to them, you know? Yep. And um, that material was all gone. And he had to start writing from scratch. And he was also going through some kind of not being able to write good stuff, period, you know? Yep. And I remember a few uh, the rehearsals where we were like, okay, maybe we should try some old unicorn songs, but with new lyrics and, and this and that. And I just felt that will not be a good album. It will be Nightingale's worst. Right. And I want to release Nightingale's best, if any, you know? Yep. So what happened really was that I decided to just let it rest what happened you know mm -hmm. and, and by the time I had written um, five new songs and I thought my brother would put together also a bunch he said I'm, I'm not I'm not getting there you know so we took one of his songs that I felt was really good mm -hmm. and uh, then I had to um, revisit some of the material I had written like around 2008 2009 and and out of of this uh, came uh, the, the track 27 Mm -hmm. uh, was was one of those tracks that I had written, but at the time it felt just like oh, it's not a good, not a good start to go with one of those kind of almost bluesy ballady style songs, you know. But then it was kind of the stuff that was missing on the record was that kind of song, so that was you know, that one, you know, came pretty much for free. And then I had to write some new material and then put some pieces together, and all of a sudden I had like forty five minutes worth of ass kicking material, and then I felt. Well, now, now I can do it. Now, now we can re record it. But it took some time, you know. We sure. spent almost a year uh, in, in recording, and, and so I mean, it's, it's a long time when, when you think about it. But it's not like I, I was sitting here every day. I was working sometimes not for months with the album because I had other commitments, you know. So for me, it was like if Nightingale are supposed to, to come back at one point, I want to give to our fans for having waited so long and, and wished for our return the best Nightingale album there's ever been. And I know mm -hmm. that that's a bold statement to even think about that because, sure. I mean, if someone would say, yeah, Rush will now make the best album of their <laughs> career, I would say, no, they're yeah. not, you know? Yeah. Right. But I felt that I want this to be the best Nightingale record. And then if it is so for a few other guys, that's wonderful. But it seems almost like everyone thinks mm -hmm. it's the best album we ever did. So for me, that's like uh, jackpot, you know? Yeah. All the work is... It felt worth it, you know, and now 
problem is how the fuck do we make another one? Well, yeah, that's that's always the case, and 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 just to confirm it, and I've, I've I'm going to be posting the review for it next week, and it's going to be pretty much a perfect review because the album is perfect in my opinion. It's it's I mean, and, and like you said, it's like how could you guys top the stuff from from before? But you have, I think, Retribution aptly titled for one is is it's perfect i mean lucifer's lament i mean 27 every and it's like every song that even the sequencing because i know that you you focus on that that each track kind of kind of works perfectly to the next start to finish uh it's a perfect album it just is thank you very very much <laughs> it's always good to hear you know yeah it, it really is now as far as now those are my favorites what are, what are your favorites on the album do you have favorite tracks yeah, I do. I do have favorite tracks, and and um, it's um, it becomes the, the one thing that becomes clearer after the album is ready. For me, it was kind of over around May already when I, I just kind of put the final mixes together and let them rest until it was really like it was a super deadline in August or whatever. But I said I finish early so I can just let it breathe, you know. And if I feel that something is horribly wrong, I can just go back and, and fix it. Yep. You know, with rest rather than the panic I had with Witherscape. Yeah. So, but it was nothing to fix. You know, I was super happy with everything. And the, the, the songs that I, I mean, I still love all the songs. Mm -hmm. But the ones I love a little bit more are really like the opening track and, and Lucifer's Lament and the Divided I Fall. Those are my three favorites because to me, they represent the, the three uh, kind of vibes that I want from Nightingale. This more up tempo, yep. epic. Of, of Stolen Wings, and then this more, this kind of, um, this kind of, I don't know, it, it's like a, a kind of a tempo that just feels right. It, it's got that kind of special groove going yeah. from, from Lucius Lamb, and it, it's also something we have used in the past for songs like Shadowland, Serenade, and Glory Days, and so yeah. that one just came out so nicely, and Divided Like Fall is one of those things I played on my acoustic for a trillion years, you know, it's just like, ah, this is a nice piece, and then... <laughs> Then I heard the Entangled song on my iPod from, from Genesis. Yep. And I just felt, wow, this, this is a really good song and there are no drums. You know, and it's got this, with it's all acoustic instruments and they all create this one sound. Yep. You cannot really say, what is that? It's all like clingly clangy things and vocals. And, and I like it. I mean, for me, it's not just like, oh, that's a song without drums. It's a fully fledged, full blooded song. And I just want to divide it like fall to be one of those breathers you have after being served mm -hmm. four tracks um, and, and especially Warriors of the Dawn which is containing some of the most brutal things we have ever done yep. tuning down the guitars more than any death metal band I've ever been in yep. and I felt here you need a contrast yep. so I just gave that nice progressive rock ballad thing you know and and I, I like all the other songs too but but th that's uh, the first two uh, the, I mean that's the reason why they are number one and two I think yeah they are the two uh, really good to have divided. I fall as number three. It's a little bit too too great, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. Because it is. It's like a one-two punch, and I and divided I fall is, is is another is one of my favorites too because it's the the melody on those. You. I went just the first time through. And I already knew those songs and the hooks, the melody, not necessarily maybe the lyrics, but the melodies, and, and not just the vocal melodies, but the melodies of, of the instruments behind it and how, they, how things intertwine with each other. It was like, that's, I'm humming it, I remember it, and it's, it's, uh, and, and it's, it's, yeah, like, it's hard to describe even on Divider's Fall because there's so, there's so much there, and it doesn't have to hit you over the head for it to be noticed. You know, it's I, I think the way that I want my, what I demand for myself when I am writing a song and also what I demand from other people writing songs, doesn't matter if they are the neighbor's kid or a Rush or Marillion, I want to remember the fucking thing. Yeah. It's just like I want to see a movie, I want to remember it. Yes. I mean, there's so many times when my uh, wife and, and, and I would sit in the sofa and we, we uh, recently had Netflix here in Germany where I live and, and we had this three months, you know, and we start looking at the... And, and we, we watched some trailers and said, did we see this movie or not? Or did we see the trailer once and thought, no, it's not for us, you know? Yeah. And then you think, fuck, we spent one and a half hour of our lives. Yep. And we don't remember it at all. Right. You know? And I think, I don't want that in music. I don't want to, to hear a record and I think, huh? 
what, what I mean, now a guy come up to me with a shotgun and say, I want you to hum or whistle one melody from that 45 minute record you just listened to. Yeah. And I couldn't. Right. Bang, you're dead, you know? Exactly. And then I think, wow, there's too much of that stuff out there. And I mean, it's like the bands are so desperate to release something that they have to record everything they do and then learn it and kind of force themselves to remember stuff that doesn't have the glue, the hook. Yeah. Exactly. Vibe, you know, exactly. but for me, there was no recording of any riff whatsoever. On uh, it's not like I said, "Oh fuck, I wrote a song yesterday. What was it like?" Yeah, it was like fucking crap because you <laughs> don't remember it. Yeah, yeah, it that's, ha- it that's the to. reason why yeah. it takes a lot of time, and I demand from me to remember it because then, if I remember it, there's a chance that you might do it too. Yeah, because we're both humans, you know. Exactly. But if I cannot remember my fucking song or my vocal harmony for the chorus. Then who will? Exactly. You know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's that's it. It it it's too often now that that a lot of these 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 bands are releasing stuff where everything's the same. There's such a sameness to every song that even the songs have no identity from each other. And you can't. You've gone 45 minutes and you're trying to remember any define even a defining moment, and there isn't one. Whereas on this, you know, on this album, each song has its absolute flat-out own identity. You you can distinguish every single song from each other, yet they all work together as a whole. And that's something I I think, like you said, they 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 record stuff because they wrote it, versus coming back to it and saying, ah, "What was that riff? Is it any good?" And grading stuff. But they cannot afford it. You know, it's like the bands these days are thinking about playing time. Okay, guys, we've got to get together a shitload of songs because we need to put out special editions and blah, blah, bonus for iTunes, this and that. So in the end, they come up with four or five really good songs, but they have to write ten more in one, like a writing session they have. And they say, oh, we all wrote the shit in three months. And I just think, oh, fuck, that album will suck so hard, you know? Yep, yep. But I know it takes more to put together 10 really good songs. You need almost to wait like five years. So the human brain, for me, is this that you need more time to produce really this A game of material. Yep. And I, I don't know how many riffs or ideas, I mean, I'm, I'm right at the moment I'm writing the second Wizardscape record and I had like 50, 60 ideas from my voice recorder from my phone. And I think every second or every third, it's just thrown away. Yep. I'm just singing something or whistling something. Like, what was I thinking? That was so <laughs> horrible. I play something on the acoustic guitar, and I, I, I get the vibe that I probably enjoyed it at the time, but it's just, for me, it's just a bunch of notes. Sure. And it's nothing there, you know? And I think, wow, when even I am so brutally honest to my own writing, you know? Right. This is what guys, they need, then maybe a producer. Like Bob Rock told Europe that, sorry, guys, your songs are not good enough. Mm-hmm. for me to work with and they say oh you're wrong they went with another guy and they sucked <laughs> if they would have yep. taken that seriously went back to the drawing board and written better songs maybe they would never have disappeared in the first place and you know, I mean sometimes it is so that the producer is ext- extremely picky but some producers just take everything and try to to work with what they've got you know yeah. Yeah. but some people really get it that it's about the material you should play the song now on fucking congas and like a ukulele mm-hmm. and you will like it because the vocal harmonies are so kick ass yep. that it doesn't matter the backing you know uh, yep. and it's a good fucking song and then sometimes you forget to write the good fucking vocal harmony on top of that awesome riff and then you have no song sorry you have a riff with a boring vocal harmony that would just kill the whole thing yep exactly i've i've said it uh, all the time, it's like a good song is a good song is a good song. You, any, you can play a good song, anyone can play a good song or cover a good song, and you, if if it's that good, you can't wreck it. There's no way to wreck it. So it, it, a good song always stands up to, to any sort of version, any kind of stripped down, built up, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, that's very, very true. And it, it's usually about... Uh a song being a little bit like a, an epiphany for the writer. You yeah. just sat down and it just kind of came to you. And I know Keith Richards once said that the stuff is already written there. It's out there in the cosmos. All you have to do is just dial in uh, with your transmitter and be an open vessel for the song to just appear in you and you perform it. Yeah. And you need a state of mind. You need, you know, 
Mm-hmm. You need actually to sit the fuck down with the guitar and be receptive. Yeah. Some people just stress it out. Oh, we have to write a song now. Here's an E chord. Oh, good. Sing something about fire. Okay, cool. The song <laughs> is ready. The fans will, who cares? We go touring, play the old songs. I mean, hey, you know, that, that's not really what it's about. But no. some people have a career that is not based on the latest record. I, I, I read that Rammstein, for example, said, yeah, we're not really thinking about putting out new stuff. We can still headline the biggest fucking festivals anyway. And people don't want to hear new stuff. Right. They want to hear the old stuff and see fire. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but they are honest about it. They're not putting out some crap as right. an excuse and then call it blah, blah, blah to work and play none of the tracks from it. Right. That is just like books because they are not selling albums anymore. It's not even an income, you know, it's even a cash cow. Yeah. The cash is the merch. Yeah. I guess. And ticket sales or whatever, but the, still the production are eating up a lot of the ticket price, so I guess the merch is really, really the fun part for most bands these days. That's a shame. That's true. Now, on a different note, vocally, first of all, your voice is... I, on on the new album, I don't know how you still sound amazing, but you do. How is it harder for you to do the death mo- death vocals, say on Witherscape, or or is it is it easier than the old days? I mean, that seems like it would stress your voice out quite a bit. Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, it's absolutely the biggest curse of my life is this that I never really did have a technique for my growling. Mm-hmm. It's just like. Um, I, it's even, it's really hard to explain it, but it, it's like to do, to be like a stuntman. And, and your favorite thing is the one where you break your neck and your spine. Ugh. You know, and it, it's like the way I feel. I grow pretty cool, but I am, as a human being, I'm fully over. And I'm sweating, I'm aching, and it's, it's pure pain. And people don't seem to get it, but I, I don't really allow people to be here when I do the growling. But they would get it. Mm-hmm. It's like screaming on the fucking top of your lungs and you're somehow compressing air to get this kind of sound going. And it's just like, I don't know, but my body cannot take it for more than a few minutes that I'm, I'm physically over and out. Yeah. I mean, my wife see it in, in like 20 seconds when I come out, oh, you've been growling. But yeah, I'm, oh, it, I'm over, you know. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> oh my God. So that, that's the curse, you know, to be able to do it on stage and all that. It's, it's like 10, 15, 20 lines of growling, then, then it's over and out. And there are a few, um, um, I don't know, say like simplifications I can do to my growls, which is a bit more in the style I used for Age of Sanity around Spectral Sorrows and Purgatory Afterglow, and also on the Moon Tower, which is a kind of a half growl yeah. that tends to sound extremely close to my full growl when recorded. Mm-hmm. But when I do it, it feels a bit like cheating because it, I know that I'm not giving 100%, only like 75. Yeah. And, and, uh, but when I listen to it uh, recorded with compression and, and, and this and that, I think, wow, fuck, it, it sounds extremely close yeah. to my full voice. It's almost a little bit annoying that, because the difference is so small, but the pain is it's a lot bigger, you know, the difference. It, it, so um, I think I will utilize that one a little bit more because I can articulate better, my timing is better, and I might be able to double stuff. And I've used it on, on the Witherscape EP for the growl parts, and um, I, I think um, that will open up a few doors for me to actually have more growls and, and not be so fucking destroyed yeah. by the whole process. Because I, I read, um, uh, you did um, uh, Slipstream for, for, for Threshold back in, I think, 07, they, they had asked you to do the growls on that, and I read that you had pretty much ripped up your voice by doing take after take after take of, of those lines for that album. I don't know if that was true. Uh, it, it's so. And, and yeah, it, it's absolutely true. And uh, I, would, um, I would say that, that it, it's kind of... It, it, what, I, what I do to my vocal cords compared to, to what I normally do when, you, know, when, when you talk and, and when, you, when you sing normally, it, it's like... You, you are, um, it's not a natural thing to do. Humans are not supposed to growl. Right. You know, face it so. It, it's not a natural technique. But when you learn to do it in a way like uh, Mikael Orkefeld from Opeth or whatever, yep. he's not that very loud. And he's not really bringing his back and knees and, and, and uh, you know, not a lot of physique into it. He's just kind of compressing and um, he's kind of like, uh, I, don't, I would say that he is uh, half the level 
of my growling in, in, in a decibel scale, you know? Yeah. And, um, but it, it's okay. He can pull it off them for a whole gig, for a whole tour. No problem. Mm -hmm. But I, would, I, I only end up coughing. When I try to do that compressed growling, yeah. I cough okay. endlessly, you know, because I, I don't have the technique. And I know the guy who sings now for Scar Symmetry, who replaced the in Edge of Sanity, he also have this kind of uh, silent growling. And he yep. can just go on forever, this guy. No problem. <laughs> but, but I am exceptionally loud. Uh, I have to even utilize a special microphone oh, when wow. I'm growling because my good bones just keep distorting. I'm horribly loud. So, uh, <laughs> and that's also, that's how the voice come there. You know, yeah. it's because it's loud. Yeah. That's the way it sounds. And I know Jorgen from Project Hate and, and Torture Division, he used to play with, with the Grave and Entomb. He's also exceptionally loud because I'm mixing Project Hate in a moment and you can almost hear the, the fucking water rattle in the background <laughs> of his vocal takes. Wow. You hear that the whole room is, is kind of bleeding into the microphone because he's so fucking loud. <laughs> and I think, how did he do it? I mean, yeah, but I mean, he's been doing it non-stop, you know? Yeah. He didn't stop. I mean, I stopped for a, for a year and a half in, in the early 90s, and that was enough. All yeah. the technique was gone, just like for an athlete, you know, who don't do high jump or whatever for, yeah. for two years and then expect to, to beat his own record. Forget it. Yeah, it's, not it, gonna it, happen. it's all physique and, and muscles and all this. And, yeah, it's true. I, I am a lousy growler from a technique point of view, but um, I do love the sound of my own growls when, it, when it's properly produced. And mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could find a way to to, uh, to adapt it, but, but even this uh, alternative growling style I have, it's, uh, I don't know, it's not my A game, and I, I like to bring that one to the records, you know? Well, sure, but I mean, at, at some point, you're, you're going to have to figure a compromise, I mean, or, or else you wind up not being able to even sing at all. I mean, if you're, yeah. if you're stressing so, uh, it that much, you know. It's hard. Yeah, I, I'm not a compromise fan, but mm -hmm. I, I get it, though. And, and, and for With Escape, I think it's also cool to have, because I have kind of its own clean voice for With Escape. Yes. And I could also utilize a, a, a less um, condensed, compressed voice uh, where there's a little bit more human tone in the growls for With Escape, because I'm planning to do a death metal solo album uh, in about two years, mm. uh, it will be released in about two years, I hope. And Ooh. there, I will need, really need to bring my A plus game when it yep. comes to growling. And I know me; I will do like ten lines a day, and then I will be just like done. I don't know if I remember the way home, even you know. And but oh. I want that one to be so amazingly fucking brutal that there is no way that I can. I can only do this the hardcore version. And uh, yep. yeah, I think maybe when you just go on doing it. You know, maybe yep. the body get used to it. <laughs> I guess you're going to find out the hard way. <laughs> so yeah, I will. Uh, so I will. on, on Witherscape, I do notice that you do have this, the, the clean voice is more of a huskier tone than, than on Nightingale. Yeah. And I, I noticed that right away. So I, like you were saying, it's, it's, it's definitely unique to that, which I thought was really cool. Now on the I think it, it's boring to do. I mean, uh, some of the riffs from With Escape, it, there's an intensity there, especially when, when you were just uh, growling your brains out, that I needed uh, some of that growl to remain. It's like, rather than, than going from a very distorted to a super clean, jazzy tone on the guitar, you go from super distorted to a crunchy, not so distorted, but still a bit dirty tone. You know, that's yep. the kind of vibe I wanted in then. But with Nightingale, I'm going from this a little bit more Witherscape-ish sometimes to mm -hmm. a really clean and nice, friendly voice, you know, which is my clear voice. And I, I try to use that a little bit for Witherscape also, but there have to be, I mean, the projects are quite similar. Yeah. They're both utilizing the similar guitar tuning and um, the same style of my writing. It's important that they don't end up sounding too much alike, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I, and then that's the thing. There's enough. There is enough distinction between the two, but there's still very much you, just just different parts of you. Which is, and, and now the, the EP. You had mentioned the EP, and there are some cover songs on that one, which I think is amazing. How did you pick the songs you were going to do? Um, usually, it, it's um, for me. Uh, it, it's Two of the tracks that I, I have chosen to do, I mean, I chose to do the cover version from Dead for a Day, okay, and then just yeah. <laughs> do it as another band, but releasing it as With Escape. That was all my idea. Okay. And uh, I just I just heard the, the Warrior track and the Kiss song, they just show up in my iPod mix that I have on the way to and from work. I have like 1,200 songs that just go endlessly on repeat. Yep, me too. Uh, <laughs> kind of, um, 
and, and at, at this time, I just heard that Defenders of Creation song from Warrior, and I said, wow, that's a cover song right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, the, the World Without Heroes, uh, I was supposed to do a, a cover version from a band called Moxie from Canada. Mm -hmm. I did a demo of it, and, and it just didn't work. First of all, I couldn't get a hold of the lyrics because it was really hard to hear it. I even contacted uh, the band itself, and I got an email from Earl Johnson from Moxie, and it just felt like when I did the cover version, it became a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, then let's do, oh, I always wanted to do a cover version of A World Without Heroes mm -hmm. since I was, I don't know, 20. For every, I mean, I wanted to do it with Edge of Sanity, wanted to do it with, with any band, you know. But yep. then I just said, now I will do it, you know. And we, we did a really cool version of it. I think it's got that epic vibe mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that even KISS fans will agree that, that we, we bring some, some epicness to it that, that it's a little bit lacking in the original because the Elder is not that kind of doesn't have that hard rock vibe to it Which that it should it, yeah, yeah. And, um, it, and then Out in the Cold was, was Ragnar's idea but um, uh, we agreed on, on doing it the way Judas Priest would have done it on Stained Class rather than on Turbo or even like Saturn of Destiny you know it's acoustic guitars rather than guitar synthesizers and uh, yeah we, it's a pretty faithful thing but I cleaned up a little bit in the vocal production because the original have way too much backing vocal interfering with the lead vocals and I always felt, why do they do that? You know, yeah. they, they, there's no punchy super vocal line that you can that you can sing along to because it's it's like, oh, let's try a lot of different ideas and then some poor person have to mix them all together and <laughs> it, it doesn't have the directness that yeah. I felt was in there. So there's like one one round of a chorus at the end of the original. And I think that's the one should have all the time, and that's the way I did it. And so it's a chance for me to revisit some of my favorite material, mm -hmm. but I think have a flaw, and yep. um, just do it the way I think is an improvement, and I honestly don't give a rat's ass if, if anyone agrees, because <laughs> that's the way it should be for me, you know? Uh, like right. with, the, with the other material, you have done some cover kind of versions that may have upset a few people, but I think, I think it's okay. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Nope. That's it's just a cover version. Nope. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's what I like about you. You don't give a rat's ass. And that's what matters. <laughs> because you can tell you can tell when people aren't being honest with their music because the music sounds like shit. It always does. You need to give your all and figure out and, 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 and fans pick up on that and sense that. So a world without heroes, The Elder is still my favorite Kiss album because it's weird and everybody else hates it. So naturally I I love it. So I'm looking forward yeah. to that cover. And isn't there a Gentle Giant cover as well on the um, the um, the CD version? I think I read that somewhere. Yeah, on, on the download version. Because okay. I mean, I, I was fighting against it all the time because for me, they're, they're over and done. They're a part of the inheritance. But apparently they were never officially released as digital downloads. They were oh. only on the physical album uh, the back version has bonus tracks and, and uh, all the CD-ROM content as a dynamic mix, but they were never available through iTunes and, and Amazon and, and this and that. And I felt like I don't care about downloads. You know, that, that's so unsexy that, yeah, do yeah. it, you know, whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, if, it, if it brings any attention again, I mean, I spent more time, or I would say we spent more time uh, recording the uh, Giant cover than, than any other song on that session. It was pure madness. I mean, the mm -hmm. only the idea to even start considering doing a Gentle Giant cover is, is insane. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing you do when you haven't done a cover version for, for some time, you know? Yep. I just felt, oh, cool, to be able to go and look for all the weird move sounds and just try mm -hmm. to nail every fucking note that they're playing on every instrument. And now I just think, oh, the easier song, <laughs> the more I feel I want to make a cover version. And face it, the three songs we did on the Widow's Cave, they're pretty easy songs. Yeah. There, there's uh, there, there's not a, a lot of strange riffing going on. It's more about vibe. And the fact that I think we all rescued the, the songs from a pretty dated production. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not saying that, that our production is, is better in in, a, in like, um, like quality-wise, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying that most of the songs needed a bit more balls yeah. to, to really, uh, I think... For, to work for me. I can only speak for myself, and I know that Ragnar loved them too, you know, and, and it's, I'm hoping that a lot of people will listen to them for what they are, and it's not to replace the original. They're like a tribute or a, like a wake-up call that maybe you just have to listen to that album with an open mind and, and, and 
like for Warrior, for example, I mean, the image that they were from outer space to save humanity and they wear stupid suits and all, it's all <laughs> crap. Yeah. But there are really cool songs on that record, but people cannot come see beyond that stupid image thing, right. I guess, you right. know? Yep. But for me, that song, when it just, it just came on, you know, I, I normally listen to all the songs in alphabetical order based on the tracks. So mm. somewhere along B, that one just showed up, and I think, wow, fuck, that's a cool song. End of story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, and that's the thing. Uh, that's what people don't get with coverage sometimes, which is always a pet peeve, is they don't put their own stamp on it or kind of give it something that it definitely could use or need. Um, you know, I always go back to um, my favorite cover of all time. It's still uh, Astronomy to Mine by um, Voivod, where they took the Floyd song and gave it unbelievable balls and and made it their own song to the point where now a lot of people don't even remember that it was a Pink Floyd song to begin with. That's I think that's, that's how, how people should do that, you know. So that's absolutely. That. But but for me that one that one was really weird because I bought Nothing Face on CD mm -hmm. in the really really early times of the CD, and for some strange reason the intro to the first song have its own track number, which fucks up the whole sequence. What? So when the first song really starts on my CD version with an extremely big fold-out of, of weird, uh, you know, the original first version. Yep. The, the first song after this weird backward intro thing or whatever it is there, there's all of a sudden after like a minute, song number two starts, which makes Astronomy to mean number three, but mm. it's technically number, you know, so I thought all the time, because I'm not a big fan of the early fight, that, that it was that song, that was the Pink Floyd song. I think, wow, this is a kick-ass rocking <laughs> song, you know? And I think, wow, that is, of course, uh, this is a, it's a great Pink Floyd song. I must check this out. And then I had the ch chance to listen to the original. Yep. And then it was like that other Voivod song. That was the Pink Floyd one. I was completely confused. <laughs> I didn't understand shit. And, and then I realized, fuck, they did something wrong in the CD manufacturer that the yeah. intro and the first song is track one. Right. Astronomy Domain is track two, yep. not song three. Wow. But it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so um, for me, that one, is, it, it still haunts me, you know? Yep. That's <laughs> uh, weird. Weird. Um, yeah. So now as far as touring goes, what it, are you have any plans to take Nightingale out? Yeah, we have actually a world tour planned. Uh, we have Metallica opening up for us <laughs> in most of Europe. <laughs> and... Uh, no, seriously, there are um, there are plans. I mean, like 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 every uh, with Nightingale, things just kind of fall into place. Yep. And and then all of a sudden, there will be a promoter asking us to do this and that, or some cool festivals. We have to play it cool. That's what what we did all the years. I I never really did anything to do any of the cool gigs we did. They just happen. Right. Some bands ask us to be support. One weird American fan, a super nice guy called Jim, paid like uh, I don't know how much. $2,500, I think, to see us live wow. in Atlanta. Wow. And then, like, 50 wonderful fans paid, like, $50 a pop to buy a shirt and, and a homemade CD to pay for the other airline ticket, you know? And, and that's the kind of thing that just happened. Yep. And we played live in Cyprus because uh, the, the label person, the end records, uh, owners, mother is a friend with the mayor <laughs> who needed a band to play in Cyprus. Wow. And then they picked my tail. We had a free holiday, a 40-minute documentary on primetime Cyprus TV. And it's just like, hey, no, you cannot, you cannot look that gig up. That gig happens, yeah. you know? Yeah. So for me, I'm, I'm just hoping that there's still a place for us there to, to do this. Oh, the guys want to really support their big fans and blah, 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 you know? And I said, yeah, cool, we're there. So we don't have time in our life to start searching for a gig on a Tuesday somewhere in Germany for eight people and losing two hundred dollars a piece. Right. It doesn't work that way for Nightingale in two thousand fourteen. So, so no touring. Um, but I would love to do a couple of festival appearances when when it's when it's more of a, of a melodic rock audience, not people who scream, "Green <laughs> songs." You know, I don't need that. Mm -hmm. I don't need that kind of death metal guys who's just waiting for the Black Tears moment. Um, um, I, I, I love the gig we did uh, supporting Kino in, in Norway, um, where we didn't even play a Edge of Sunny song. We were just a progressive rock band opening up for yeah. members of Marillion in Invite, you know. Yeah. And I was like, this is our own ground. 
Yep. So hopefully more of those. Well, that's good. And of course, I have one more question, and and now you've already set up the question, so this is going to be really horrible for me. But I have to ask, Crimson Three? I guess not, then, huh? <laughs> I have actually, I've been playing around with the idea, I've told a few people that I, I should do it and right. make it 40 seconds and rather than 40 <laughs> minutes, get the people to shut the fuck up, you know, and just like grim talk, grim talk, grim talk for 40 seconds, oh doing some like mortician demo style of yep. death metal with drum machines, just a horrible yep. cookie monster rolling, yep. and say, yeah, that's Crimson 3 for you, and, you know, and sorry you know guys, what? but... It'll sell. I, that's the sad part. Yeah, I, mean, I would say that, that uh, yeah, but when I listen back to the material I have written for the Witherscape record, and um, I would say that, that what people like from the Crimson 2, if that's the one they're into, yep. the Crimson 2 plus a possible Moon Tower, it's all embedded in the material for the second Witherscape record. Yeah. You just have to know your vibes. Absolutely. You just have to get it. Oh, that's, you know, it will all be songwriting from me, uh, which is in this time. I cannot just sit down and write Crimson stuff. I mean, the first album happened by accident. It was just a bunch of ideas written in the spur of the moment, and we thought people would shoot us. Instead, we were like number one on the distributor charts for like two months. Yep. That never happened in our normal 10 song albums. And we were just lucky at the time when it was a little bit happening with Opeth and but still not really happening. I mean, we had Mike as a guest, and everyone was like, you have a member from OPEC, the oil company? No, OPEC. <laughs> no, uh, I don't know if I've heard of it, you know? Yep. And I would say, yeah, they're the best band ever, but nobody heard of them. And um, and then around the time of Princeton 2, it was, I had really found my style of epic death metal writing. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just continue that vibe, but for me to sit down and, and do that kind of 40-minute track, I I am over I was. I was realizing already doing Crimson 2 that that was a once in a lifetime deal. That you have to be five guys in a room all really just feeling that we had 24 hours to write 40 minutes of music and let's just fucking do it. And we did it. And that's never going to happen again. Yep. No, I hear so. you. I hear you. That makes sense. And I think, you know, for, for me, the, the style of, of the Crimson albums and, and, and really Edge of Sanity in general, to me, carries, it makes more sense. Witherscape, to me, is almost like the, the current modern version of that in some ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, it should it, be. Yeah, 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 but the thing is, is, I cannot sit down and just make a decision, oh, okay, I could write a carbon copy of Crimson, again, right. exactly adapting the same style, the same tempo, to switch a few notes around. Yeah. But I could also do it and just be completely free, but you can never get that kick again. You no. can never have that back, you know? No. No. There's a reason why, why some bands don't, don't do it. I mean, some did, and it was horrible, but, but some bands still don't go back and, and revisit the, the classic uh, concept albums. And, and also, you shouldn't do that with movies. You don't need a, a Shining 2 or a 7 Part 2. You don't, I mean... Some, some stuff just starts and ends yep. and eat itself in the process. Yep. There's like nothing left. It all vanished into nothing. And there's nothing to build on. For me, Crimson 2 was all about making money. And it's not one of my proudest moments, but to my defense, I have to say that it's a pretty good record. That's really awesome ideas. Yep. I just wish I didn't have to put it together in a computer. I wish it could have been more organic the way the first one without a metronome and shit. But, right. I mean, I wanted that one to be a Dawn Swanner album. I wanted it to be yeah. something that was not, I mean, and then the label, have, they, they, they were sometimes doing things so far out that you couldn't read them. They say, yeah, but if you call it Edge of Sanity, uh, we will give you like 800% uh, more money. Oh, jeez. And at the time, I was really having financial trouble, and I just felt, okay, let's face it here, what, what do I want? I want money. Okay, <laughs> let's fucking do it. And I had to do this nerve-wracking uh, meeting with, with four of the band members from Edge of Sanity. We go to, to, the, to their hometown, me and, and Boss, and the label sitting at one side, and the other guys, I have to stare at them, and they say, I want to release an album without you guys and call it Edge of Sanity because I need money, and the label needs the back catalog to sell. And it was just one of those moments I never want to have again. Yeah. It was really an awkward thing. And I think such a cash-in, yep. such a horror, and I've read about bands doing it, but no original members. Let's call it the band anyway, you know? Right, right. And I think it's lucky for me that it kind of worked. You know, some people even believe it's better than the first one. And 
it's not not really a horrible musical thing but for me it was n not one of my proudest moments and there is no going back after that that kind of just yeah. left a yeah. weird vibe yeah. and that that it could be so horribly about figures and numbers that yeah of course an Age of Sanity album brings the back catalog into Spain there's merch there is record sales are tenfold at the mm. moment I just put that logo instead of my name on the record and that's a horrible thing for a creative person like myself to hear yep. but it is so wow. that's the brutal fucking truth and one part I like about the, the record industry being a little bit fucked or pretty fucked yeah. is that it's not that important anymore because the sales someone said when you sell 10,000 now they're so happy they don't know what to do Right. and it's about how good are your lives then you know, how good is the fucking record? I don't care what's on it. I don't care the title, the cover. Is it any good? Yes. Because that's the selling point you still have left. It, and what I am selling is really your time. Mm -hmm. I want you to listen to my record and you seem to like it, so you listen to it. Exactly. And your price today, apart from a download or whatever, is 45 minutes of your time and I want that to be an experience. None of all that other thing really uh, happens to me. I, I'm in a good financial situation with, with mixing and mastering. I don't need to record or release any new music ever again. Mm -hmm. But I want to do it because I, I feel feel somehow an urge to do it. That, that bug bit me once and it, it's still in there, yep. bugging me, haha, -ha, to <laughs> do new stuff, you know, and I just had to. And uh, to be an inside out also, it's like, Wow, you know, here you are after 25 records as a recording artist on your dream label. Yeah. And I mean, for so many bands, dream label would be uh, Epic or Sony or BMG or whatever. For me, it was always Inside Out. Yep. Yeah, I um, mean, Inside that's Out. That's my is, label, but how the fuck? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Inside Out is great. I mean, they're they're perfect, and they they just and I was I was really glad that you you hooked up with them as well because to me that's a match made in heaven. Is there any chance that they would? Yeah. Can they release, um, reissue the the the, uh, the back catalog of Nightingale, or is that uh, kind of? I don't out? think so. I think Black Mark is holding on to that one uh. because uh, technically Black Mark is, is uh, I don't know the structure really anymore, so I shouldn't say too much. But uh, okay. Plastic Head is behind Black Mark uh. with the manufacturer, and so and it, it's it's uh, one of the things that that have the Black Mark label have Bathory and Extra Sanity, uh, Extra Sanity. They have Cemetery. And make tears, I think. Yeah. That could be worth anything in any way. Negotiation with a new distributor or whatever, that's, that's like uh, val valuable stuff. Yeah. And they don't give up Nightingale or Edge of Sanity or anything. I mean, they, they have been burned. I, I'm, I managed to get one time a license recording, uh, license release from the end in America released alive again in America as the end record, licensed from Black Mark. Uh -huh. That's the only time. And it turned out that he, he made absolutely no money whatsoever from that. And he is just burned from business deals that promised a lot but gave nothing and fucked up um, like a time frame to release something. Mm. And, uh, and Boss is just very anti um, that kind of license deals. Sure. And that's it. He, he don't even, yeah, it's just like a big fat no. Well. <laughs> but um, I'm happy. I mean, me and my wife started this merchandise company, Sano Merch, where we are, uh, we printed a pandemonium t-shirt and we just did the Purgatory Afterglow yep. t-shirt. And I spent a lot of time hunting down the original uh, scan or in this, in those days you photographed the painting mm -hmm. onto a little weird plastic thing called a Dia. I don't know what it's called in, in American, but it, it's kind of the original. It, it's like the size of a matchbox. It's okay. crazy weird. And then you somehow turn this into a, a badass looking uh, uh, thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> through some weird process. And we hunt down the original uh, from the, the original author and we printed the shirt and they sold really well. Mm -hmm. But it was all like black mark. We just needed to, to get sure that, that we had a clearance for that. And, and in the end, Actually, they, they say, it's okay, you can do it, you know, and I was so happy because yeah. I was afraid there would be licensing problems and this and that, and, but, but we always, we were close, you know, I was like the first guy to sign ever with that label apart from Quarton, mm -hmm. so um, it, it's pretty okay, but I mean, not all labels are that super nice when it comes to rights and all this, so, so um, yeah, it, it's been good, and we hopefully we carry on doing so much of Sanity merchandise and let the legacy live on through yeah. that kind of stuff because yeah. th there's a, a bunch of generations actually not not only the, the later ones from my generation also the ones from like my son 
uh, generation, the people born in the early 90s, they are now like, yeah, death metal, fuck yeah, you know? <laughs> and they were born around the time Purgatory F no came out. Yep. And they never had the chance in hell to buy a teacher because they were like one year old. You exactly. Know? So, um, yeah, and now, now we give them the chance to, uh, we are doing the Nightingale Retribution t shirt now. And it's, uh, the pre orders are, are, are acting up. They're really coming together. It's not like the rush from Purgatory F to go, but it's still really good. That's so, uh, cool. we are just hoping to keep the merch thing. Uh, coming and going also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was I was psyched to see that because I did I saw that on Facebook. I liked the Swano merch and 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 it's cool. The Nightingale has its own page approved by Swano. I was like, yep, that's the one right there, and <laughs> and a fan page. And yeah, we're actually working, you know. No, I, and it's cool. I know that because I, I have actually seen your wife on Facebook because she I have a um a progressive music page called oddly enough progressive music page, and I saw she liked the page. <laughs> And I was like, "Oh my God, Dan's wife likes my page!" And I'm such a geek. I was like, <laughs> I was like so excited. Yeah, I'm but like, we're working on the uh, the, of the official Nightingale homepage, the first one that really works. Yeah. Uh, and we found an American guy called Justin, who's just the awesomest, super coolest webmaster. And he's he's doing this um, the graphic stuff. I just asked him to put up something on on the on the domain in the meantime, and he just made this kick-ass banner with a. With a with a timer counting down, and it's just like a million bucks worth of design. I think, wow. Like, wow, okay. Wow. Normally, you would have a white page saying under construction. Yep. This guy just kicked major yep. ass. So, so we're lucky to find that kind of guy, you know, because yeah, he was behind the scenes and in the prog power gig with it in Atlanta. Yep. Uh, I don't know when. It was a long time ago, and and he was just kind of a fan who liked to help. Yep. So that's awesome. Why not? <laughs> yeah, really, that's awesome. Well, I gotta let you go, Dan. I actually do have to get back to work, which sucks. I would. Yeah, talk, I, have I, would, a, I have an album to mix. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I wish I had an album to mix. But anyway, um, it, it, it was super, super awesome to talk to you, Dan. I'm a huge, huge fan. Have been for a long time. So glad you're cool. back. Awesome. So glad you're back recording. Nice conversation. Yeah, it's really cool. I've done a lot of interviews, and, and uh, somehow it's easier for me to talk to a native uh, English. Speaking, and then I have no. I mean, I'm, I'm not being uh, uh, having any problems with, with people who don't speak English. But sometimes sure. it's yeah. it's easier to communicate more of a conversion and you know, have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. By other, because they are often so nervous, right. and they are reading in a language they speak maybe once a month, and yeah. it's it's like I'm giving them the scoop of a lifetime. And, and the next question is, uh, will there be a touring? And I say, I just told you that I yeah. would do this and that, and like. You don't listen, you know, because maybe you don't understand. Well, yeah, and you, you know what I told you. Yeah. Exactly. So that that's all. It's always nice for me to talk to um, either in Swedish or in English. Well, that's the thing. I'm doing. It, it, I'm, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I, I it's kind of weird for me in that I'm doing a, I'm working for a Danish website, but I'm in the U.S. and I'm like I'm there. I'm their token American, I think. But um, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I saw that. It's not, I thought, ah, oh, fuck, now I get the wrong number here, um, because that's definitely an American area code, and they say Denmark here, and it's like, oh, yeah, right, <laughs> going to end up somewhere, you know, but um, it's been happening quite a lot, uh, that, that people, I mean, internet, it's like this world wide web, you know, oh, yeah. so someone working from that country is in that country, or live in this way, like, I'm a Swedish guy living in Germany. Yeah, so, hey, yeah exactly, oh. and it just, it just worked out, <laughs> it works out good for me, because they, they kind of needed the, the the, the prog metal guy and that's kind of what I love and it was a good opportunity and just the interview thing for me is is totally new and I just thought I can't sit here and just ask questions this has to be a, a conversation not an interview because it's just it's too robotic I, and I just can't do that so so I'm glad no, I, I've done, I, I had the opportunity to talk to Malcolm Dome actually one of the most respected journalists of, of all time in metal. I think he even was the one responsible for the term thrash metal yes. being invented. And um, I spoke to him and I was so nervous I couldn't eat. I was I was like shaking when I dialed the number. But he was such a cool guy. And and uh, for me, it, it's it's really so that, that some people just have it all down because all of a sudden I started talking about Journey and how much they mean to me. And he just went right on it. What do you like about them? What's this and that? And blah, 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 blah. And th that's nothing you can you predict, you know? It's yep. just so. And then you get it that this guy has been interviewing guys for like 40 years, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. It's a different thing. Well, all right. I really Okay, I gotta it. split. I gotta walk the dog. 
Okay. Take care, Dan. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. Have a nice day. You too. Have a weekend. Okay. Bye-bye.